I'll leave it on. I had it on. I think you look cool, man. I think you look cool. Anyhow, yeah, extra one cover, man. Yeah. We're back here in the basement, and we have a couple generations here of uh, uh, the craftsmanship here. Aaron Barnard, of course, comes from uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and his education in this field started at a place called Red Wing up in Minnesota. That's right. Yep. And uh, culminated at uh, a place in Waterloo called uh, Tenor Madness. You know, and uh, he's he's really on on his own now, doing his own thing. Besides, still working with Tenor Madness. So, and. Uh, over here is my brother Russ, who I uh, I can remember. He said, "I sort of think I'd like repair." When was that? Around 1968. <laughs> well, it was when uh, before that, um, sitting there watching Nick Engelman. Right, right, in right. So in the fifties. In, in the fifties, I used to see. Right, all those, that's. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. See all those musicians show up, uh, and I used yeah. to sit and watch him fix instruments. And he was the one that said, "You, you you're taking an interest in this." So that was uh, probably what, late fifties. Yeah, late, late fifties. Yeah, 50s. I mean that was the famous card game. Right. Uh, you know, you know, and I, I learned about this card game in 1952, uh, when I was standing outside the Metropole with my aunt Mary first, and then I used to go there with Russ, and he used to be, uh, you know, a li the little guy. My mo our parent mother thought <laughs> we were going to Olympic Park. We were on the bus to New York to watch Coleman Hawkins play at the Metropole, you know. Stand out front. Stand out front, and, he, and Roy Eldridge and him and... Uh, everybody. Yeah. Gene Krupa it was unbelievable. Woody Herman, everybody played Yeah, there. everybody played there. The Metropole, 48th Street and 7th Avenue. Right. And uh, it, the bar is still there. I don't know what it is now, but uh, the bandstand was right in the front, and uh, Hawkins would always come outside and I used to, you know, hey, I played a saxophone, what do I do? He says, well, there's an important card game you've got to go over and see. It's in, around the corner on 48th Street. Yeah, that's right. And it's Lynx and Long. And uh, it's up on the second floor. You just go and watch that card game and you learn what you need to. So, sure enough, I did. And over the years, I met so many famous players, even people like Eric Dolphy, they all came to Nick Engelman. Everybody came to see Nick Engelman. He was the inventor of the... Well, the resonator, actually. Yeah, actually, right. He made the first resonator. He was the... I believe he said he did it with a Merle Johnson or something. They did. Right! And, uh, you know, uh, the other night I did a talk on Merle Johnson because he had a mouthpiece under the name Selmer in the 30s. It was an extremely classical style mouthpiece, and he used to insist on all his students playing this mouthpiece. Phil Bodner, uh, at Romeo Penquay, to name a couple guys. And uh, I got this information, by the way, from Lawrence Feldman, who knows the history better than me. And uh, Merle Johnston would always ask them to uh, use his mouthpiece. They would use it at the lesson and never on the gig. And then he'd call him up and say, you didn't play my mouthpiece on the gig. <laughs> <laughs> but he was the one, that I always remember Nick Engelman saying that, that they put this idea together with the resonators. Right, right, right. And the resonator, of course, is what we're dealing with here. You know, we were having a discussion this week, weren't we, Aaron, about uh, resonators. You know, we, we got some in brass, we got some in sterling, we got some in nylon. And I think our final conclusion is... Just it's much more, more important is how they're put in, how the pads done. Uh, they well, all would, they all work. Would you think that the different material is going to change the same change something with the uh, sound? Mm, some some yeah. I mean would the sterling silver seemed to make it. What would you feel? It made it darker. No, I say brighter. Brighter. I would say brighter, wouldn't you? Yeah. Okay. The brass is sort of in the middle. And, and how about gold? Oh, not enough experience with gold. No, I, I it's know. off the charts now. Do it right. Well, yeah, I know, I know that, I, know that uh, I think, I believe Yannick Asawa has something that they're putting in. Some yeah, I, well, I had a few at one point. I, I put them in some horns. Lord knows where those horns are. <laughs> Scrap for the gold. Right, right, right. If, if anything, you know, I always have to think I have a gold flute, you know. Would I be better off melting it down? <laughs> Anyhow, um, 
Link sent along. Never. Yeah, and, and then Joe that's Allard, what, and then go, everybody. Right, everybody went to Joe Allard after Links and Long. That well, they the guys at Links and Long pointed me to Joe Allard, and uh, also uh, a couple of his students that I was studying with in New Jersey, Joe Saldo, and Bob McGarry, and uh, and that's how I ended up with the famous Stan Getz content. And right, tell that story. Yeah, well, Russ, I had to get Russ a tenor, a tenor when in the early '60s. And so uh, there's a tenor, a ten M that uh, Stan Getz is pictured with in the Tootsie Roll and those things in the early fifties. Well, it's, it's also when he was playing the, the with what's the Stan Kenton? Yeah, he's no, playing, Stan Woody. No, it was I think Stan, it was, it was Stan Kenton. I think in the Stan Kenton band he's playing the ten M. But I happened to be over there to pick up the horn, and Getz was in there. Not how could he be getting a lesson from you know at mm -hmm. the level he played at? But Joe would be showing him some armature techniques, you know, breathing right, and things. Right, right, right. And I said to Joe, I said, I'm here to pick up the saxophone. He said, well, one of these two, and he, one was at the 10M and the other one was uh, Chew Berry. And he said, why don't you take the 10M? That was Stan Getz's. And Getz was there. He said, yeah, kid, that's a good horn. And that's how I ended up with that horn. And the horn actually was a 10M with a Mark VI right. neck. Yeah, we wow. took it. And we then, a Mark uh, as meeting. if that, as if fate would have it, 20 Five years later, I'm in the horn business here in New Jersey in the late 80s, and what horn comes in the door but that very horn? Well, because I, well, I had sold that horn back to Joe, or he took it back, and then I picked up about three years later the Selmer that I have. Mm -hmm. And um, when I got into repairing in the early, by maybe, well, I was repairing by the mid 70s I see this horn come in the shop in Dorn and Kirshner and I said boy that case looks just like my old tenor case I opened it up and sure enough that's what it was so I went up front to the owner of the store I said whose horn is this he says oh that's what, uh, Steve Kaplan Bob Kaplan right and sure enough Bob Kaplan used to get lessons from Joe he lived out in New York and he would get in and I got it from him you got it from him I got, got it from him Lord knows where it is now. You sold it to somebody <laughs> in Italy. Right, right, exactly. You Thank sold you. it to somebody in Italy with a story, if you want to believe who owned this horn at one time, we, we can't document it, but this but, is... This and is, he liked the story. He liked but this the is story. a true story. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, anyhow, yeah. Well, well oh, no, we, did, we didn't finish. We have to finish where you... Uh, Russ was... Aaron went to Red Wing... Russ was a teacher and apprentice also. With Freddie uh, Kirshner. Fred, Freddie Kirshner. Who, was, was who started a, um, a he, after World War II, he was a World War II vet, and he started Eastern School of Musical Instrument Repair, uh, basically for the uh, veterans and that, with the GI building, and, and he was a very knowledgeable, well-known in, uh, in the repair world, as a complete authority on instruments. Uh, everybody respected him. Uh, all the manufacturers respected him. Fred Kirshner worked in Manhattan. You know, and uh, he actually learned from Freddie Engelman, if I'm not mistaken, Nick Engelman's brother. Oh, really? Right. Freddie Engelman oh, was, was... See, now there's history I don't know. Right. No, so, but but <laughs> Freddie, Freddie ran Eastern School, and uh, like I said, he was, you know, I wish I could go with seances with him right now and get some information from him because he knew everything about the old horns. Everything there is to know. Right. Including dro dropping the cap in a busher. Right. <laughs> you know, so to, so to, to remove the gurgle. <laughs> to remove the gurgle. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we hope you've enjoyed this. <laughs> All right. That was good. That was good.